I've come to a very important conclusion recently. The state will only end one of two ways. Now you might be thinking, oh, here goes another libertarian with his doom and gloom. If we don't pick up the pitchforks and storm the castles now, it's another thousand years of tyranny and darkness. But no, you know that's not me. I've never been a fear monger. I've never been one to sensationalize these things. In fact, the conclusion that I'm about to share with you is dramatic particularly because of its reassuring nature because of its tameness, because of its sort of disappointment, if you will, for so many libertarians who are eager to fight injustice and conquer the greatest evil of the world that we know today. That is, of course, organized, violent, territorial gangs known as governments. But I really I have some bad news. Either it's going to end through a political revolution, uh, a, a real paradigm shift that is then manifest in politics, and, and I would humbly submit that my platform of localization, of dissolving the federal government, might be the first major domino to fall. That is, the falling of the great empire of the American government. But if it's not, and if it's not pretty damn soon, technology is going to render the state irrelevant for us. Not just obsolete. To say that the state is going to be obsolete is to suggest that at some point it was technologically advantageous. That was the best humanity could come up with. But no, that is, that is not the case. Now, I want to go through a number of specific technologies, a cluster, if you will, that I believe make it inevitable that the state is going to be at most of 5%, roughly, of its current relevance in the next 20 years. I think they prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know maybe you're going to want to do the math. Maybe there's some great technology even here that I'm, I'm forgetting or some other possibility that I'm not considering. But I, I, given these technologies, I'm talking about self-driving cars, uh, the internet itself, the end of the drug war, which is not a technology, but I think a product of the internet itself, obviously, uh, Bitcoin, uh, biometrics, um, a lot of what we're doing in 3D printing, and artificial intelligence. Now, I'm going to come back to go through each one of these and examine why I think each one is, in and of itself, just, just alone, uh, such, such an important threat to the existence of the state that, that, that any of these going uh, to, to their conclusion to being fully implemented could uh, lead to uh, the irrelevance of the state. But I need, I need you first to understand what I have already concluded to before coming to this current existential crisis, I guess you could call it, that I'm, I'm experiencing at this point, that, that, that the demise of the state is inevitable. And I, I use these words, I've, I've used these lines over and over and over again, but I, I really never get sick of saying that we are living in the most peaceful times in human history. What a beautiful thing to celebrate and appreciate that we have come to this point. We have gotten so ethical. And this is just an, an, a, a matter of the natural course of progress of intelligent life, of, of, of humanity. I, I don't think there's anything more special to it than that, that in, in the general marketplace of, of human interactions, nonviolent transactions, interactions, relationships beat out the violent, coercive ones of government. Not that hard to predict. But that all of the forces driving this, and, and a lot of them are technological, primarily, really, uh, but social evolution as well, uh, awareness, global connectedness, things like that, n none of those trends driving uh, that bigger trend of the decline in violence are ever going to go away. And this isn't something that I'm just pulling out of my butt. I always cite Professor Steven Pinker at Harvard, who great, gave a great TED Talk on this and, and wrote a great book about it, and, and has proven academically that we are living in the most peaceful times in history. And in none of his theories, 
Is there some crazy phenomenon reversal? You know, like uh, for all of human existence, uh, there was this great decline, parabolic arc, or whatever it is, a you know, radioactive decay arc uh, of, of the decline of violence, and then suddenly it spiked. No. No, I guess you could say that there are uh, a couple of caveats to this whole thing, like we blow each other up with nuclear weapons first, uh, or, or that, that an asteroid hits the planet. Of course, all that could throw off all of these uh, potential trajectories, but that being said, the forces of nature are very clear in the progress. Now, the next thing I, I, I need to give by way of, of background for this conclusion is something that I've considered about the uh, the rate of change that we are experiencing. And I talk about this in my book in the, in the section in chapter 10, The Future of Freedom. The section is called The Asymptote. And the asymptote is the vertical line or the straight line that, that a, a, an exponential function is always striving towards but never reaches. And I know it's kind of funny to say that it's something that we're never going to reach. And maybe, maybe that's the great irony of this. Maybe this is, this is going to be the great trick that, that reality plays on, on me, that, that there is uh, uh, never this point. But even that being said, clearly there is an acceleration of the human experience driven by technology. And to, to, to put this in real practical terms that are easy for under, anyone to understand, I, I, and I could be using decimals, I could go back in, in tens, but I want you to consider just the change of the last 20 years. I think that gives us a good window, a change of, uh, of the last 20 years, not since the invention of the internet, obviously, but since the, the, the general mainstream adoption and implementation of the internet. And we're still seeing the, the potential of, uh, of the internet coming into reality. It, it, it is, you know, relatively speaking, in its infancy. But if you just look at how much it has fundamentally changed society over the last 20 years, you can fairly compare that to the change that humanity experienced over the 200 years prior to that. And you can look at the change over the last 200 years and you can pretty fairly compare it to the change that humanity experienced in the 2,000 years prior to that. And unsurprisingly, the same is roughly true for the 20,000 and the 200,000, and I guess there were at the dawn of humanity. Now, that's very easy to look backwards in time and see the scope of the change that humanity has experienced already. But bring it back to the present for just a second here. Because the implication of this, should this trend continue, the change that we have experienced in the last 20 years, we are about to experience in the next two years. And then that same general scale of change will occur in the next two to three months, and then in a matter of weeks, and then days, and then hours, and then minutes. And to me, that's the asymptote. Now, on the bigger scale of the timing here, why do I say government gets down to, say, 5% of its, its current relevance? And, and, of course, odds are it would be a lot less than that. But 5%. Imagine if the Libertarian Party had 5% of the motivation, 5% of the reason. If the entire freedom movement had 5% of the evils of government to rail against. Now, I have to point out something very important here also that, uh, in understanding uh, what I mean by the, the evils of government and, and, and sort of trying to measure the, the relevance of government. And, and a lot of libertarians make the mistake of thinking that big government is always worse than small government. I can say, prove that that's not true with a little thought experiment, right? Would you rather have a government that's huge and approximates what the market would provide but uses just enough coercion to maintain its monopolies? Or would you rather have one that's tiny, that's 1% of the population, but murders every firstborn child? Obviously the evil of government is not measured by its size, but by how much it violently takes us away from what our natural state of harmony would be without it, without that violence in society. So if that's the case, 
government getting down to 5% relevance means that we don't really have a reason to care anymore. We're done, essentially, as libertarians. Just the, the, the value that we provide uh, of being right about everything, uh, of, of having the correct analysis, is, is irrelevant. The, the, the motivation for it, government is, is reduced to something that, that people are able to go, yeah, well, well, it's, the, it's the government thing. It's like... Uh, you know, some vestigial organ of society that we just don't care about anymore, that's just there, uh, you know, taking up space and doesn't really bother anybody, isn't, isn't really that relevant. And the reason I say this is because these changes are really on the horizon. And, and everybody looking at this technology, I'd like to think that, that what I am providing here is somewhat of a unique analysis looking at these technologies through the lens of how they're going to affect government. Because that's what libertarians are concerned with, right? Because we, we're concerned with justice. As activists, we are motivated by a deep-seated sense of injustice. We want to see the world set right. We want to see nothing less than a world set free in our lifetime. Well, I think the situation is in some ways worse in the sense that you might not have that much of an opportunity to take care of this thing and better in the sense that it truly is inevitable and right on the horizon. So let me get into these technologies. We'll go through one at a time. First from fortune.com, I want to reference this story. Here's when having a self-driving car will be a normal thing. They point out that the World Health Organization estimates that there were about one and a quarter million traffic fatalities worldwide. This is uh, 2013. Self-driving cars eliminate human error and distraction, a major cause of those accidents. 40,000 Americans die on U.S. roads every year. And that's because government roads. Yeah, and the thing about the, the, the self-driving cars, we have the technology. We've had it for a long time. Why has it not been implemented? That in and of itself is because of government. Maybe they see... The problem coming. Maybe if you're, you know, one of the super elites and you have a driver already, you can hire a driver to take you everywhere you go. Maybe the, the, you know, inducement of a, the enticement of self-driving cars isn't particularly relevant for you. And if you know that having self-driving cars is going to take a big chunk out of the government racket, then you're you're going to oppose this. I don't know if that's if it's that conscientious and deliberate on any individual or group's part, but anyway. According to the U.S. Census, the average American commutes more than 26 minutes each way or 500 days spent commuting per lifetime. In an autonomous car, will be able to use this time for work or leisure. Finally, consumers will save money as autonomous ride-sharing fleets reduce the cost of transportation. So not even looking at all the ways that this is going to change you know, the efficiency in all the markets that are going to be affected by this in oil and gas, in auto parts, and repair, and public transportation, all of that. Just the time. And here's how crazy it is. This is from AAA, AAA, newsroom.aaa.com. Americans spend an average of 17,600 minutes driving each year. American drivers spend an average of more than 17,600 minutes behind the wheel each year, according to a new survey from the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety. What does this come out to? According to Jurek Grabowski, research director for the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, the amount of time... The average driver spends behind the wheel each year is equivalent to seven 40-hour weeks at the office. Holy crap. Now, if you do the math on this, just to put this in perspective, that's about 13% of the weeks during the year, of the time in the year you spend driving you would get that productivity back. Now, keep in mind, the average American is working for government half the year. When you add up all the fees, fines, hidden costs, taxes, everything else to government, the average working American is working for government half the year. Yeah, it's insane that we've got it to that level. Well, why is it possible? There's a little important sidebar, I suppose, on this. A libertarian can no longer run uh, against how bad life is, at least not in the United States, not in, this, in, in, at the, in the seat of the empire here, no. Uh, maybe in other parts of the world you could run on, uh, you know, government is bad, government is evil, government is a threat, and it still is, but can, like, um, Americans are, we, we're eating ourselves to death, we are smoking ourselves to death at a, at a greater rate than, than government is harming us. We, we have become so prosperous, life is so good, quality of life is so high, and it's going to keep getting better. Libertarians will not be ever able to win on a platform of 
things are terrible, quality of life sucks, vote for me and I'll provide relief from the, the two parties. It's always going to be, and I really think from this point onward, it's going to have to be, uh, and, and this is a good thing, an, an optimistic vision. Say, look, you know, the, the world is getting to be a better place. Government is obsolete. It is holding us back. The sooner we get rid of it, the better off we'll all be. That's the only message that is going to be able to just carry any water in, in, the, in the current reality. So, yeah, we can, we can rail against the evils of government all day long, and I will as long as they are out there, but self-driving cars, just to put this in perspective, if you're working for government half the year, that's a tax burden. We, we're going to eliminate about a third of that with self-driving cars because you get your time back. That's the value of that. You become so much more ca capable. The productive capacity goes up by that much just because of this one little technological innovation. We have it already. So timing on this, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, in my generation who grew up with the Jetsons are like, wow, I thought we'd have flying cars by now. And, and of course, we know now that they would be self-flying, autonomously navigated. So... According to the Fortune article, Tesla CEO Elon Musk claims that we are two years away from sleeping in our cars. And this story is from September 2017, most of a year ago already. Now, the more conservative estimate here comes from uh, Kyle Vogt, CEO of General Motors, Cruise Automation, uh, announced this week that GM has built the world's fat first ma mass producible car designed to operate without a driver based on the Chevy Bolt. However, he even he acknowledges that GM is waiting on improvements in self-driving software and legislation to make his vision a reality. So, programming and and government that's that those are the hurdles that, that remain to be cleared. Today, 99.9% .9 of all vehicles on the road do not have the technology to enable full autonomy. Self-driving cars won't hit our roads in a noticeable way until 2020. Now he goes, oh, not until 2020. That that's <coughs> uh, two years away at this point not even a blink of an eye evolutionarily and we're going yeah self-driving cars well we're, you're gonna have to wait a couple of years i mean that that's how how great our expectation uh, of progress is oh you're gonna have to wait two years sir before you can buy a self-driving car at the dealership i don't know why i'm trying to do a dr phil voice with this by 2040 we estimate that 95 percent of new vehicles sold Maybe it's because all the, the guys should ever be trusted to do is sell cars. By 2040, we maybe that's too much for him. By 2040, we estimate that 95% of new vehicles sold or 96.3 million cars will be fully autonomous. $3.6 trillion opportunity. Now, you know, why, Adam, why are you starting with this? Why is this, why self-driving cars? Well, we go now to bjs.gov. That's not bjs.gov. Uh, it's, yeah, really, it's not what you're thinking. It's Bureau of Justice Statistics from the Office of Justice Programs page on traffic stops. The most common reason for contact with the police is being a driver in a traffic stop. In 2001, an estimated 42% of face-to-face -face contacts that U.S. residents had with police occurred for this reason. About half of all traffic stops that year resulted in a traffic ticket. Excuse me. Approximately 3% of all stop drivers were searched by police during a traffic stop. So, the government roads safety racket goes away. Done. Nobody gets pulled over driving anymore. This means the DUI racket goes away and unless you face a DUI I never have myself I, I do take that pretty seriously but I, I understand that there are a lot of people who have been falsely accused of, of what should be a crime of endangerment but I, and I've, I've done the checkpoints I've gone and punked the checkpoints and warned people to avoid them so you know where you know my loyalty stand on this with freedom it's gone and here's the here's the best part about it the drug war the drug war the drug war is going away. And if you just take away traffic stops, a huge, huge part of that just disappears. Sorry, cops. You don't get to do that anymore. It's just not feasible. You don't get to pull someone over for swerving in a self-driving car and then bust them because their, their car smelled like pot. Their pot smelled like a car. That sounds like something a stoner would say. So... 
again, the, the internet driving so much of this and the awareness of this and the, and the capabilities of the internet gives us, make it possible for all these things. So I just, I know this isn't a technology, but I just want to take a second to point out that we are now clearly somewhere in the middle of the end of the war on drugs. You should say, we are at the end of the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. A little nod to Churchill. But at this point, you go traveling the country with weed. Well, I have to worry about it here on the map, and I have to worry about it here, and I don't have to worry about it here, and I don't have to worry about it here, and I don't have to worry about it here. It's, you can count the election cycles. Uh, Chuck Schumer, and it's insane that, that, that someone who presided over so much evil of government so, and, and, and promoted and still promotes so much unethical statism and gets to be the one, uh, might get to be the one to take credit for ending the war on drugs because he, he rescheduled marijuana at the federal level and you know, led to it uh, being legalized nationally. But you just see already, uh, it's, it's really difficult at this point to be elected on an anti-marijuana platform in most of the country, vast majority. The only people holding on to the drug war, aside from all the special interests and especially law enforcement, uh, but politically, it's the politicians who have been reelected after having been elected, uh, you know, possibly decades ago, certainly cycles ago, on either ambivalent or anti-drug platforms. But now, even here, this is from the Associated Press from May 15, 2018, Manhattan DA says he'll stop prosecuting pot possession. Yeah, just, no, it's not going to happen anymore. And he used the racial disparity as an excuse. Faced with fresh evidence of the racial disparity in marijuana enforcement across New York City, Manhattan's district attorney said Tuesday he will largely stop prosecuting people for possessing or smoking marijuana. Like, you didn't know the drug war was racist when you started it? Holy shit. This was this is in the, in, in, in the, the, the quotes, the statements from, from people in the Nixon administration. Yeah, we wanted to make it easy to, to bust hippies and black people. But no, now, anyway, this is uh, the move by District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. came the same day that Mayor Bill de Blasio promised the city's police department would overhaul its marijuana enforcement policies in the next 30 days. Brooklyn's DA also said he would scale back prosecutions. But now we come to the big one. Bitcoin! Now, if you've read Ron Paul's and the Fed, if you have any idea whatsoever how monetary policy works, if, you have, if you've ever asked the question mommy where does money come from and gotten a halfway decent answer you know that the monetary racket the mon the money policy racket the federal reserve system which is a private bank a pi private public partnership a privately owned bank with a special deal with government to be the sole creator of the nation's money supply that is allowed by government and, and to create money out of thin air and forced uh, a government that forces the people to use it by collecting in taxes. This is this is just an underpinning of the entire government racket. This is how they steal from you when they can't tax you. you know, they just borrow more money through the Federal Reserve System, through the banking system, through fractional reserve banking. The money supply goes up. This is the big lie about inflation. We're, we're taught that inflation is, is price has gone up. Oh my gosh, you got to worry about price inflation, which is a real misuse of the original term of inflation, which was used to describe inflation of the money supply. They inflate the monetary supply. The supply of U.S. dollars goes up. The value goes down. Supply and demand applies to currency as well. Really simple. So you, as soon as, as the cat was out of the bag with Bitcoin, I mean, 2009, they must have seen the end coming. Uh, I mean, I have a feeling that a, a major chunk of, of, of Bitcoin out there is owned by uh, the same assholes behind the current system of exp uh, uh, oppression that we experience through governments. The string pullers, the elites, the super class. Because they must have known that this was about to take their biggest toys away. That this was about to put money in the hands of the people. But you know what? Ultimately, in a sense, I want to say it doesn't matter. It's a stepping stone to what the zeitgeist people describe as a post-scarcity economy. Now, I know because I've studied economics, there's no such thing as post-scarcity. But the zeitgeist people are powerfully right about the idea that we are going to soon have a superfluous ability to provide food, clothing, shelter, medical supplies, and energy, and manufactured goods through uh, just the, the general increase in human productivity. I do want to point out 3D printing, because I don't have an article about it, but 3D printing, and I've, you've, you've probably seen 
me rant about how we're all going to be wizards soon, that 3D printers are going to get so small and at the molecular level they'll be able to fit on our fingertips and be controlled by computers from our brains and be able to reprocess material out of thin air and suck it into existence and just blah, zap stuff into reality eventually. Yeah, we're all going to be freaking wizards, okay? That's what's on the horizon here. Taking away government money with cryptocurrency is just accelerating us getting to the point where money is almost a silly concept that, that, that you, yeah, there's maybe, maybe there's still, you know, I, and I don't know, maybe, maybe people have thought this through economically better than I have. Maybe there will always, and, and yeah, I know at some, there will, there will always be some uh, form of money for exchange of things that, that are scarce commodities that are, are in limited supply. Maybe it's going to be land or art or, or people or knowledge or whatever the case may be. There, there, there's, there's always going to be some, kind of a monetary system or you know value system for those exchanges but when it comes to just basic human needs it, it's not really going to be all that relevant and bitcoin is is just the biggest factor right now making this possible because you can see again the the, the bitcoin is inevitable the, 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 how do they shut down bitcoin you can't make it illegal when you can use it anonymously and, and i gotta say the silk road also, huge essential innovation made possible by Bitcoin. God bless Ross Ulbricht in rotting in, in, in jail right now. I hope that we can get him out by, by dissolving the federal government, by, by electing someone eventually who's just going to pardon everybody who's in jail for victimless crimes like, like I would. But this innovation made it possible for drugs to be distributed safely, uh, anonymously through the mail with, with an anonymous cryptocurrency system that still allowed for a reputation system among the sellers. I mean, that was just... Mm. Uh, and it's, 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 it's one of these critical bridge technologies. It's saying, fuck you to the man right now. Fuck you to the current system. Fuck you to your limitations. That's what this technology is all about. You want to say I can't? Fuck you, I can. So anyway, Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm, 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 is it going to be Bitcoin? Is it going to be uh, some other cryptocurrency, some basket of cryptocurrencies, you know, as I predicted in the past? I don't know. I don't. I don't particularly care because it's coming. It's going to take away the mon the money supply. And and, and just to, to put this in, in perspective, now in U.S. dollars, and this is according to HowStuffWorks.com. How much actual money is there in the world according to M2 money supply of all the cash money plus yada yada yada? They say it's about 1.2 trillion dollars in US cash, but 10.5 US trillion dollars in existence. The current Bitcoin market cap, according to coinmarketcap.com, is approximately 140 billion US dollars. As of uh, right now, Bitcoin trading at just over $8,000. And this is having come from nothing, from zero to that, it is now you know, maybe it's on the scale of, you know, one or 2% or a percent of, of the U S dollars. Of course it's displaced other fiat currencies around the world, but it is such an obviously superior monetary instrument product money itself that we could be one killer app away from Bitcoin displacing fiat currencies entirely all over the world. And it's just done it. This, this could happen in a matter of months. Bitcoin going to a million dollars, Bitcoin going to, you know, but maybe, maybe just being more conservative, maybe Bitcoin just, just barely continues its, its exponential rise. And we see Bitcoin go up tenfold this year and tenfold next year. And well, guess what? Pretty soon it's displaced all fiat currency all over the world. On what time scale is this going to happen? It's hard to predict, but now you go, yeah, Adam, it, it's, it's hard to predict that it would take a lot longer than 10 years. It, it really is hard to imagine that it's going to take humanity more than 10 years to realize that, that we have a, a better alternative to government money. It's crazy. And if, if just that happens, we don't get any other technology, any, none of these things come through, right? No self-driving cars, drug war continues. Just Bitcoin, just cryptocurrency, I should say, displacing fiat currency. That's happening. 
And that is going to radically change things for government. It's going to radically, therefore, change things for libertarians. Next thing, and this is kind of a, a, a weird little story as an example of this. The Pentagon has a big plan to solve identity, identity verification in two years. And this is just a recent one, May 16, 2018, from nextgov.com. The De Defense Department is funding a project that officials say could revolutionize the way companies, federal agencies, and the military itself verify that people are who they say they are, and it could be available in most commercial smartphones within two years. The technology, which will be embedded in smartphones hardware, will analyze a variety of identifiers that are unique to an individual, such as the hand pressure and wrist tension when the person holds a smartphone, and the person's peculiar gait while walking. That's G-A-I-T, gait while walking, the, the way that you walk, said Steve Wallace, technical director at Defense Information Systems Agency. So you can, with these biometrics, with reasonable certainty, identify someone. And for the Defense Department, this is about you know giving them access to sensitive files on the phone or to a computer terminal or to a secure facility. But this is not really the point of all of this. Some people see these technologies and go, oh my gosh, it's terrible because... Your data is going to be there and government's going to have access to it. It's not a problem when government doesn't exist. It's not a problem when we can secure it reasonably well and, and make sure that if not, no one can get in it, no one can get in it without uh, proper authorization or without there being some record of it. What I imagine we're going to go to, and, and again, if it's not this, it, it's going to be something as r fundamentally different uh, for the human experience with the application of these technologies. I think you're going to have a... a video camera in your contact lens that is constantly uploading your entire life as a video feed to the cloud and no one can access it but you or you know un under certain specific circumstances and if someone were to hack it and and you know we'll have it with of course with with blockchain cryptography it'll be you know uh, damn near impossible to hack anyway you're you're going to have uh, you know if someone gets in you're going to have a record of it it's going to be obvious and and, and they're going to face worse shanks, you know criminal sanctions for violating your privacy whereas with government you know you 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 have um you know the problem that they can do it without repercussions i mean that's 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 the real uh, one of the important critical dynamics of government is that they protect uh evil doers from liability you can't kill people unless you're working for government in which case they give you uh they give you a medal and a promotion the biotechnology, the biohacking, the biometrics, all of that, the, the surveillance state, I don't have a problem with the technology. The technology is fundamentally empowering. In fact, it's a technology that's empowering us with body cameras on police. It's empowering uh, us to keep government more accountable. And technology is always distributed faster over time. Like with the cell phone, it, it was distributed all over the world much faster than, than the printing press led to books being a uh, ubiquitous presence on, on the planet, this uh, technology, the, the surveillance state is a problem. The surveillance technology, the tracking, the accountability is not. When you have, and you will, when there's no government or negligible government, you will have the option to opt out. But, you know, this is, I'm, I'm jumping out a little bit to the conclusions and, and why there is an important difference in, in the two ways that these things go. Um, but I, I want to go like one step further in, in just pointing this out. Subcutaneous Fitbits. These cows are modeling the tracking technology of the future. This is from technologyreview.com. That's MIT Technology Review. And this came from um, a, a company that ended up becoming Livestock Labs. They wanted to put this in humans and ended up experimenting with cows and then becoming a big business with cows. And then now they're going back to humans. Livestock Lab CEO Tim Cannon never set out to make what is, in essence, an embedded Fitbit for cows. What he really wanted was to use the same technology to re-engineer himself and anyone else who wanted to do likewise. Cannon, a software developer and biohacker, took his first plunge into surgically upgrading himself in 2010 after seeing a video of a Scottish biohacker named Left Anonym t talking about the sensations produced by a magnet she implanted in her finger. Shortly thereafter, he got his own finger magnet, magnet and co-founded Grindhouse Wetware, a biohacking startup in, Phil in Pittsburgh that focuses on designing and building implantable devices. Do you, do you, are you starting to see how these technologies are converging? 
I got one more here that's going to blow your mind because this is this is current news. This is not future prediction. This is where we are right now. From the WashingtonPost.com, a soldier needed an ear transplant. Doctors grew a new one in her arm. In her freaking arm. Two, year, two years ago, Army Private Shamika Baraj almost died when she was ejected from her car during a crash in Texas. Afterward, when she woke up in the hospital, she wasn't whole. Her entire left ear was gone. But now the 21-year-old is on the path to recovery and a procedure hailed as the first of its kind in the Army. An ear was reconstructed and grown under the skin of her right forearm, according to the Army. Now, I, I'm not doubting the Army on this one. They, there's, there's a photograph here. I don't think this is a hoax. They used the soldier's own cartilage and the ear was later attached to her head the, the army said she recovered her hearing that the operation was a success. Your own body is something that we can now, I mean, I, we talk about like knee replacements, hip replacements, like it's not a big deal anymore. I, I have uh, laser eye correction surgery. I have all these other procedures I'm like, looking forward to getting. Maybe that we can save that for a, a, another show. This is where we are. This is where we are right now. But there's one huge technology on the horizon that I, I, I don't think libertarians talk enough about. I like we don't we don't almost pretend that that this isn't coming, you know. I mean, maybe it's something about politics, but it's as if it like freezes us in, in the present day. And and we have come to the point, I hope I made this clear and and looking at the exponential exponential nature of this, where for the first time you have to anticipate technological change over the course of a single election cycle. Over two years, you have to anticipate that the world you face is going to be radically different. That if you're running for president, that the course of change over a four-year term is going to be so radical that if you're running on a status platform of managing this Leviathan, your policies from your campaign might be irrelevant by the end of your first term. If, if there even is a government to preside over at this point. So artificial intelligence. We go back to MIT Technology Review. The headline is, experts predict when artificial intelligence will exceed human performance. Artificial intelligence and changing, is changing the world and doing it at breakneck speed. The promise is that intelligent machines will be able to do every task better and more cheaply than humans. Rightly or wrongly, one industry after another is falling under its spell, even though few have benefited significantly so far. And that raises an interesting question. When will artificial intelligence exceed human performance? More specifically, when will a machine do your job better than you? Well, already machines are doing jobs better than humans could, could possibly imagine just by, by virtue of being reliable and having perfect memories. And just already replacing so many jobs. When we say artificial intelligence, I, I suppose in this sense we're, we're talking about something that is on the scale uh, of the intelligence of, of an individual human. Of course, it's going to be much more than that right away. I mean, already, as I said, in some ways, computers are way more capable than human beings. It's just in the ways that they're not, when they get those, they will be so much more intelligent effectively that they're really just going to blow us away. This is going to, this is going to so radically change the human experience. And, and the timing is, is this article describes it is, is really amazing. Today we have an answer of sorts, thanks to the work of Katja Grace at the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford and a few pals. To find out, these guys ask the experts. They surveyed the world's leading researchers in artificial intelligence by asking them when they think intelligent machines will better humans in a wide range of tasks. And many of the answers are something of, of a surprise. And they, they came up with this really cool chart 
that plots the, the median answer as a dot and then has bars for the range of all of these experts here. So go, so, so this, is, this is just, this is so cool. And I haven't even gotten to the best part yet. It gets better, it gets better. I haven't even gotten to the conclusion. The experts that Grace and company co-opted were academics and industry experts who gave papers at the International Conference on Machine Learning in July 20, 000, 2015 and the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference in December 2015. These are two of the most important events for experts in artificial intelligence, so it's a good bet that many of the world's experts were on this list. Grace and company asked them all. 1,634 of them. We're talking about a good sample size. 1,634 experts to fill in a survey about when artificial intelligence would be better and cheaper than humans at a variety of tasks. 352 responded. They then calculated their median responses. So they predicted that AI will outperform humans for translating languages by 2024. So by 2024, and we already have stuff that's effectively, we have Google Translate on our phones. You can just, this is like, seriously, just like mind-blowing crap. I got to use this last time I was in Mexico. You have, there's, there's, there's an app for your phone. You have a smartphone. You can do this. You can pick up a phone and, and point the camera at something in a different language, and it'll display it in the same font in whatever language you have it set to. Ha, ha, ha. It's it's there, you know the babblefish thing. Like this is this is a uh, from from um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't don't forget to bring a towel. Don't forget to bring a towel. They they have this thing that you you put in your ear. It was a fish. <laughs> you could hear anything and translate it to your language. We're about to be able to have a computer that does it that literally will fit in our ears. If you want that, you can have that. Writing high school essays by 2026. Yeah, you think education isn't going to be shifted? We haven't even talked about that. What are the effects on, on education, on, on children growing up, and, and what they have access to just with the internet? Which is Khan Academy compared to statist government indoctrination centers known as, as public schools, government schools. Driving trucks by 2027. It's not going to take that long. And hold on, it gets better, because this, we, we, this is 2015. Now... This story is from 2017, so from two years later, already, there's, there's, you'll see. But many other tasks will take much longer for machines to master. AI won't be better at humans at retail until 2031, able to write a best-selling book until 2049, or capable of working as a surgeon until 2053. Now, some of these you go, okay, cool, we're going to put those people out of a job. Okay, that's, yeah, that makes sense. We're going to automate that, this, that, and the other. And then you go, but then in the middle of this list, Write a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> what? And, and the experts predict that that is, is going to be happening by 2049? Uh, how? I, I'm just stop and think about how is, is How drastically different is the human experience going to be when you can just tell a computer, I want a best-selling quality novel about whatever the heck is on my mind right now about Tom Green humping a dead moose and and Smurfs. I want I want a New York Times quality best-selling novel about that. Go. And and it doesn't just like eventually come up with it like, you know, a thousand monkeys on typewriters. No, it's just boom, done. There it is. Holy crap. Now, the experts are far from infallible they predicted that ai would be better than humans at go that's the the chinese game by 2027 this was in 2015 remember in fact google's DeepMind subsidiary has already developed an artificial intelligence capable of beating the best humans that took two years rather than the predicted 12. <clears throat> The experts go on to predict a 50% chance that AI will be better than humans at more or less everything in about 45 years. You really think it's going to take that long? I, I, I think there's a point at which, like, see, this gets to the, the concept of the asymptote. Like, right now, I could, I could probably, you know, I get online here and I could look up uh, where the fastest supercomputer is and, and what the Internet is telling me might be reliable, right? There might be a faster one out there. 
but pretty soon, hello computer, design the next fastest computer, and it's done, just like that, boom. That's where we're coming to with this. Now, the funny thing is, they also asked, what uh, what they thought of the AI researcher. How soon will artificial intelligence render the artificial intelligence researcher themselves uh, obsolete? And they said uh, so, uh, the median on that was uh, 82 and a half years. And some predicted much longer. But for automation of all human jobs, a lot of these predictions say that 45 years. 45 years within within our lifetimes. But already the capabilities are increasing exponentially and we are going to be pushing this. This isn't something we're not going to wait till we have the perfect artificial intelligence, before, you know, be capable of working as a surgeon. <laughs> we're going to have robots cutting us up pretty soon here. Don't you worry at all. The thing is what what does this mean for then for for everything? Now, don't think just about artificial intelligence. Think about robots with artificial intelligence that are extremely cheap. Anybody can afford a perfect personal assistant robot with superhuman strength and intelligence. Why would we want them to be robots serving us instead of us being them? That, that's what we are, we are eventually going to make ourselves capable of that. We're not going to sit there and have these things, these machines sitting around. Anyway. The 40-year prediction horizon should always raise alarm bells. According to some energy experts, cost-effective fusion energy is about 40 years away, but it always has been. Yada, yada, yada. 40 years is an important number when humans make predictions because it is the length of most people's working lives. So any predicted change that is further away than that means the change will happen beyond the working lifetime of everyone who is working today. Except for one other cluster of technologies that needs to be brought into this cluster as a subcluster, I suppose, would be life extension technologies. Yeah. According to Dr. Aubrey de Grey, we have, we may have already reached longevity escape velocity, the point at which human life expectancy is going up by more than one year per year. And I don't mean the actual average life expectancy of the average American who is eating and smoking themselves to death but our capacity, rather, for life expectancy. If you're young and healthy today, congratulations. You probably made it. Unless you die soon, you are only going to die of old age if you choose to. Now, take me, for example. I'm 36, starting to feel my age, but relatively healthy. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe aged a little bit beyond my 36 years with uh, exposure to certain chemicals in the military, to, to, a, to a, a certain, let's just say, more than my share of physical injuries through the military and through, through sports. But I'm, I'm 36. I'm overall, I'm young and I'm healthy. And my life expectancy is, you know, well over 80, right? And that's over 40 years away from now. Hmm. Imagine that. If you're young and healthy today, by the time you get to age 100, which is a reasonable expectation even now, by the time you get to be age 100, we will have cured all of the diseases that 100-year-olds die from. And by the time you get to be 200, we will have cured all the diseases that 200 year olds die from. And eventually either we will engineer the human body itself to never expire, to be able to control it molecule by molecule or at least cell by cell. If not that, we are going to completely displace these crude mortal coils and physical shells with technology, It'd become robots. This is, this is on the horizon for humanity. So, back to the story here with artificial intelligence, before we get to my, my grand conclusions here. But teasing apart the numbers shows something interesting. This 45-year prediction is the median figure 
from all the experts. Perhaps some subset of this group is more expert than the others. To find out if different groups made different predictions, Grace and company looked at how the predictions changed with the age of the researchers, the number of their citations as a measure of their expertise, and their region of origin. It turns out that age and expertise make no difference to the prediction, but origin does. While North American researchers expect AI to outperform humans at everything in 74 years, researchers from Asia expect it in just 30 years. That big difference is hard to explain, and it raises an interesting question. What do Asian researchers know that North Americans don't? Or vice versa? Either way, from this particular story, we see that these researchers drastically overestimated the time that it would take for artificial intelligence to at least be able to beat humans at the game of Go. And I'm on the, not, not the side of optimism, but on the side of, uh, you know, if anything, I would, I would side with the more optimistic researchers here. I'm, I'm a little more of the Asian school when it comes to futuristic AI predictions, yes. But 30 years or 74 years doesn't really make a big difference because we see that in terms of the social implications, the implications for our lives, the, these are all happening very quickly, very soon. And within our lifetimes, we will get to this point of the asymptote of the human experience. So what does this mean for government? Bringing it back to that. It's going to be a, a vestigial organ by the time half of these technologies come to their maturity, which, which I, I really can't imagine not having a radical change of the, the shift of the scale necessary to get government down to practically irrelevant. I, I see 10 to 20 years and I, and I, and I kind of, you know, very, I know it sounds kind of off the top of my head, but this is pretty well thought out. This five and why, as I said, this 5% benchmark of relevance. I think we're going to hit that in the next 10 to 20 years. And this really radically changes our mission as, as libertarians because we're not going to wake people up in that much time, in, in, the, in that time frame. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. Technology is going to beat us to a broad paradigm shift unless, unless some miracle happens and someone gives me $86 million tomorrow and I can put my book in every mailbox in America. And even then, that would not get us to that complete shift that would get us a, a portion of the way there. We don't have long. So back to the two outcomes. Either we have a political revolution, we have this paradigm shift, we get government localized, we get it out of the way, and all this happens that much faster, that much more peacefully, that much more fairly, equitably, and justly, most importantly. But if we don't, and technology basically beats us to it. It means that we are going to have the vestigial organ of government around for a long time. But no one's going to care. It's not going to be that relevant. The flavor of humanity hitting the asthma. So this is, this, is, this is what makes it sort of... You know, these are forces of nature, bigger than, than any individual humans, bigger than any political movement bigger than, than any of us as individuals, we don't get to determine, and I've said this before, even without this, this understanding of, of technology and the timing, that we don't get to determine human destiny because it is ultimately determined by forces of nature. We get to change the face of it. We get to imprint our character on it. We get to decide if we are on the side of justice or injustice. We get to make it happen faster or slower and we get to enjoy life more or less as we choose and are capable.
I'm sorry, I'm so absorbed with this idea. I have so many different conflicting thoughts. I have so many, uh, you know, I, it almost feels like an existential crisis. Like, if this is the case, what the fuck are we doing here? Why do we care? Why do we, why risk your life fighting the state? Why not just hide for a couple of years, let it go away? Why not just, why not just retire and enjoy life and forget about all of this? You know, I, I am no less compelled to fight the current injustice of the world. It bothers me no less that Ross Ulbricht is in a jail cell. It bothers me no less that people in Syria are dying. It bothers me no less than people in Palestine are dying. It bothers me no less that lives are ruined every day, that there are two million Americans in jail, that we are being robbed <clears throat> to pay for the largesse of evil people. It just gives me a little comfort, I suppose, to know that even if we fail, we will win. There is a certain motivation here for me, though, that, that does get a little deeper, not just then wanting for myself to, to leave my mark on this, to know that I contributed to justice, that I had some role in moving humanity forward, but also that I, I really do hope that before we get to this state of enlightenment and, and and maybe it doesn't matter maybe really ultimately it doesn't matter this is this and this is the sort of hard thing to accept what if what if really it, what if, what if it really doesn't matter what if what if i run for president and i win and i get to dissolve the federal government and i'm hailed as a hero of, of humanity and everybody gets it and uh, state governments are dissolved and Government is localized down to the community level worldwide just as artificial intelligence hits. Just in time so we can get artificial intelligence without worrying about government controlling it. And go, yes, we did it. Change the culture. Change the paradigm. While it still mattered, while it was still relevant, we got people thinking about freedom enough that it lessened the harm and the pain and the suffering of the state but what if we fail and the outcome as far as most people is concerned is more or less the same even now looking at the news I, I somehow feel that there's this class of people who feed off of conflict and and use it to make themselves relevant. I'm thinking especially of Donald Trump, of course, right now, but uh, like the Israel-Palestine issue as, as a long-term sustaining issue where the more conflict there is, the more money and attention the rest of the world throws at that problem. There's no way that that we keep doing that. I wanted to stop as soon as possible. And I suppose that's what it comes down to. That's what motivates me. Is that, you know, I'm, I'm very humbled by this realization that what we are able to do as individuals in, in the fight for freedom as it were. And I've, I've often said this is not a revolution so much as it is an evolution. And I've never been more confident in that idea. Maybe as individuals, all, all we can say is, well, I saved one life. I helped one person. I made things better for, for a few people who were going to be harmed by government who weren't otherwise as a result. And I suppose the conclusion or the, the takeaway from all of this, for me, the effect upon me, is that it is both comforting and encouraging. For a while, I thought that toying with this idea that exploring this came with the risk of me having to uh, abandon the cause and say, you know what, it doesn't matter. I'm just, I'm just going to be greedy and selfish. I'm not going to take any more risks. It's more important for me to make it to the asymptote, to make it to see a stateless society. 
but I suppose part of what uh, what makes us activists is, is recognition that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And the more I understand what we are doing in a way that I, I think most libertarians don't, I think most libertarians don't take the time to consider the implications of technology. Uh, and, 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 and by the way, this implication, one of the implications of this for the Libertarian Party, for the, the movement that wants to see this change uh, politically, is we better be keeping up with the times. We better be suggesting something that is policy-wise in line with this technological reality. Because some version of the status quo is not going to make a difference. It's not going to motivate people. It's not going to incite, excite people. It's not going to get people to care when government is already, you know, uh, at least a lot of us would think or, or hope a, a relative afterthought in our lives. You know, most Americans are rationally ignorant of government. They make it uh, uh, as irrelevant in their lives as possible. And they live happier as a result of that. Maybe libertarians could learn something from them. But if we want to do this and if we really want to save lives... We, we can't be tinkering around the edges at this point. We cannot be hoping for incremental change. The change that we are going to see politically, if it is going to come, if, if politics is going to have any role at all in this, as opposed to you know, being jerked around by the collar, by technology, we have to step up. We have to provide real leadership. We have to provide real alternatives. And I, and I hope that by listening to me, get into all of the minutiae of these ideas that, I, that, that are so important and, and, and valuable to me that at least you get some of the same appreciation and comfort and encouragement and understanding and enlightenment that I get out of it. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your post and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.